<clears throat> okay, uh, today we'll talk, uh, we'll begin, we'll talk about three uh, cultural uh, personalities, but we'll start with the George Edmund Street, uh, a very important uh, British uh, Victorian uh, architect uh, who was born in 1824 and died at 57 in uh, 1881. Architects today live much longer than that, but uh, uh, George Edmund Street is one we cannot forget. Uh, George Edmund Street, as you see, born on, uh, on um, uh, the 20th of June, 1824, also known as G.E. Street, was an English architect born at Woodford in Essex. Essex. Stylistically, Street was a leading practitioner of the Victorian Gothic revival. Though mainly an ecclesiastical architect, in other words, he built many churches, he's perhaps best known as the designer of the Royal Courts of Justice on the Strand in London. Now, the, the Gothic revival in Victorian England is a very interesting phenomenon. And they had uh, important architects, uh, quite a number, who worked uh, um, very, very convincingly in what is called a neo-Gothic neo architecture. Um, it's kind of interesting because the, you know, the, the, the British uh, have a very romantic uh, landscaping, I mean, in landscape architecture, and also uh, the, the uh, total devotion to the neo-Gothic or the Gothic is a phenomenon worth contemplating. So there is some kind of a, flirtation with romanticism, with the romantic spirit via the Gothic, uh, well, the, you know, the Middle Ages that inspired the 19th century in, uh, in Great Britain. Not only in Great Britain, but in Great Britain, there was a, a very, very intense uh, movement uh, in, in, in uh, what is called, uh, you know, the Gothic revival. Uh, you know, the initiator maybe was Pugin, Augustus uh, Pugin, who died mad at 40, but he built 40 churches and uh, other things and published it extensively. He was in love with the Gothic times. And I think the Gothic times are uh, uh, a source of inspiration that uh, should not be neglected. Usually architects, uh, uh, you know, prefer to get inspired by the Renaissance or what, what followed the Renaissance. But I think what preceded the Renaissance, that is the Middle Ages and even the Romanesque architecture uh, are very, very, very important. The Gothic is, is important mainly because as um, Kumaraswamy, an important Indian, um, scholar and theoretician of culture said, in the Gothic times, in the Middle Ages, Europe uh, was kind of like the Asian societies of that time. The last time when the European uh, society collectively built, uh, you know, places of worship. So Kumaraswamy thought that uh, at that particular time in the Middle Ages, Europe resembled uh, Southeast Asia or other parts of Asia where, you know, important uh, um, uh, temples were built anonymously by uh, master builders, uh, architects, artists, and so on. I read uh, um, that uh, actually the, the best accomplished, aesthetically speaking, artistically speaking, um, aspects of, uh, let's say, the Hindu temples, where those uh, where the, the artists, the craftsmen, the sculptors, the architects worked intentionally for the glory of the above, meaning for the gods, not for the eye of the passerby, of the terrestrial passerby. No, in fact, the best accomplished parts were those which were not seen. And I, 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 I live for a while in France because I love the Gothic and I love the cathedrals and always moved me the fact that those incredible French cathedrals were built anonymously. There are very few names known and they built beautifully. 
absolutely beautifully. Chartres Cathedral was built, rebuilt in the 12th century in 25 years by a little village of 25,000 people. New York City, which has almost 20 million people and all the money in the world and all the technology in the world, they cannot finalize St. John the Divine Cathedral, which is uh, essentially a pastiche, is the largest cathedral in the world, but it's not highly original. While the little village Chartres in France in the 12th century, without technology, without money, they rebuilt because the first one was burned down. Uh, this happened often. Um, uh, they rebuilt the, the, the magnificent Chartres Cathedral in 25 years. Why? Because they had faith. That's why. They had faith. We have money, we have technology, we have uh, all the means to build whatever, to all the way up to the moon, but we don't have faith. That's what it is. But this gentleman, I think he had. And not just him, there were important, uh, very important architects in the 19th century in, in Great Britain. And he is one of them uh, who built lots of churches. Now, let's, uh, let's, uh, let's uh, contemplate his work. Uh, George Edmund Street, um, a serious man, a sensitive man, a handsome man, well-dressed. What can we say? Um, George Edmund Street. The new law courts. I guess this is his, uh, you know, the building he's most famous for. But uh, he actually is considered an ecclesiastic uh, uh, architect because he built many, many churches, drawings. Um, what can we say? Cathedrals, of course. What else are we looking at here? Now, for the modern eye, we might say that this is not, um, you know, a very creative or very innovative work. But they didn't, they didn't understand creativity in the same way we do now. You know, being iconoclastic and uh, rebelliously different. You know, they 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 respected the Gothic, and uh, there were innovations, but not, uh, you know, uh, of an alarming. Uh, um, you know, a character, so to speak. This is a rendering for that, uh, you know, uh, palace of justice, if we are to call it. So itself influenced by the Gothic, by the Middle Ages. This is a monastery. Uh, they built a lot at that time. Uh, there was also the love of ruins, as you can see. Uh, the 19th century, uh, not only the 19th century, after all, Piranesi lived in the 18th century, but uh, the, the, there, was, there was this uh, contemplation of the passing of time and ruins did just that, served just that. Uh, uh, okay. So um, if, if you are interested, I would suggest to, to uh, study further Gothic architecture because Gothic architecture was impressive, not just at the level of cathedrals, but also at the level of urbanism. You know, who doesn't love medieval towns? I don't know of anyone who doesn't like uh, the charm of a medieval town or city. They are very, very, uh, you know, uh, uh, humane and, uh, and uh, you know, picturesque. You know, in Romania, everybody loves Sighishwara or Sibi or other parts of some some towns and cities where the the you know the medieval uh, air is still somehow present. Uh, this is a chair by um, uh, George um, uh, Streets. Anyway, Street New Churches by G. E. Street. Uh, now G. E. in the United States stands for General Electric. So, you know, it would be very easy to, to remember his name, at least uh, with the first two initials, GE General Electrics. Now, I should not have said this. It sounds like a, a questionable way of, to, of remembering his name. The former parish church of SS Philip and James in Oxford. Uh, you know, these churches uh, might not impress us very much because the, the architectural language is not... Uh, you know, uh, outrageous in any way, 
But um, I'm sure if you pass by this church, it would uh, still impress you today in the 21st century. St. Mary's Church in Viscovi, this church was completed in 1849 and was built mainly from the local reddish colored Viscovi slates. Um, the truth is, assuming the, the Gothic uh, architectural language, uh, you could still innovate a lot. Like, for example, the spire here, I think, uh, based on an octagon, I'm not sure that I, I, I saw, you know, something even close to what we look at here in the histories of uh, medieval architecture. So, you know, uh, of course, there were inevitable uh, uh, discoveries or innovations. St. James, the greater church in Berkshire, again, now, they are impressive also for, uh, you know, uh, considering the materials used for building these buildings, a lot of stone, no, uh, ceramic tiles for the, uh, for the roofs and so on. We don't uh, quite work any longer like this. Uh, Parish Church of St. John, another one in Oxfordshire. Um, I always like when there are, uh, when there is a small cemetery in the proximity of the church, you know, and not a formal cemetery, but just, you know, crosses scattered around the church. I think uh, uh, it's probably a, an appropriate uh, place. Uh, St. Michael and All Angels Parish Church, again, Berkshire. Uh, I mean, really, if an architect today would build just one of these churches, and would feel accomplished. Just one. And he built, I don't know, tens of them. And he's, he died rather, I mean, kind of young at 57. Church of England. Um, well, they have the, they had the means, of course. Uh, Great Britain was rich. Uh, and uh, you know, they they erected they erected lots of churches. And you will say, okay, he was the only architect who built churches, <laughs> not at all. I know, I know, and I'm not a, an expert in, um, you know, Victorian architecture, but I know I even made presentations about six, seven, if not eight architects, different architects in the 19th century. I think together they built at least two, three hundred churches and cathedrals. All Saints Church, another one. Sorry for the resolution. But they are remarkable buildings. I mean, you uh, <laughs> look again, you know, if you build just this building today and you say, I did something in my life. And this man has one after the other. Stone, let us, uh, let us say it again. It is stone, you know, this is uh, not built of, uh, you know, uh, very perishable material. They, they were not unhappy to work within a certain style. You know, they assumed a certain style and uh, within that style, they manifested their creativity and their freedom. What is this? St. Peter's Parish Church or, or Oxfordshire again. Uh, sorry again for the, for the picture. Uh, another, I don't know if we didn't look at it uh, before, it's a little bit similar to what we saw uh, before, but uh, I don't know, they impress me. And I have to tell you, when I lived for a short while in, in Paris, I liked more a 19th century neo-Gothic cathedral than Notre Dame. Now you could say something wrong with me, which is also possible, but um, in a strange way, the newer cathedral, the one from the 19th century, looked more authentic than, uh, than Notre Dame. And I wonder why Auguste Rodin, the great, great, great French sculptor uh, who wrote the most beautiful book on cathedrals, and I, I strongly uh, recommend you, if you have time and interest to read it, it's called Le Cathedral de France, the Cathedrals of France, this man wrote beautifully about the Gothic, about Gothic architecture, about the cathedrals. But in that book, 
which is about the French cathedrals, he didn't include Notre Dame. How do you explain it? And he was living and working in Paris. The truth is something is wrong with Notre Dame, especially now when it is uh, cleaned up. The, well, not I'm not talking about what happened with the, with the fire, but the Western facade was uh, excessively uh, cleaned up and uh, it looks uh, it looks inauthentic somehow, even if it might be um, another church here, 1857, with completed spires or not completed, it doesn't matter. I like these small village, uh, small churches, you know, uh, rural churches. I I, I I I like the dispersion of these small buildings as opposed to you know uh, a cathedral which dominates a whole country. Uh, plus, there is the you know the proximity of nature of trees and the scattered uh, um, you know uh, uh, gravestones and so on. I, I I really don't know how he how he managed to build so many churches. But I have to tell you, I lived for a long while in, in, uh, in uh, New York and some years in Brooklyn, New York and Brooklyn, Brooklyn, New York. Uh, I still don't believe what I read, but that's what I read. And I read a few times has 11,000 churches, 11,000 churches. Can you imagine? The truth is where I live, there was an intersection and with a little church in each corner of the, of the intersection. Four little churches, small, it's true, but well built uh, and for different denominations. Very, very interesting. 11,000 churches, Brooklyn, New York. I still don't believe it. I have to double check again this information. Although I, um, I, I, I did that a while ago and maybe I should do it again. I still don't believe it. Yeah, I, I don't know. This man probably built at, at least 50 churches, if not 100. I, I just show here, it's a, a quick ad memoir of the churches built by this um, uh, British architect of the 19th century. Today, Monarch Daily, I read that slate, and you know, most of these churches have slate on the roofing, uh, is a very sustainable material. It is true. It is sustainable because it lasts a long time. Unfortunately, it's not uh, inexpensive. Another Church of England, St. John the Baptist. All Saints Parish Church. After a while, actually, I, 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 I begin to be a little bit dizzy after looking at so many churches. Um, another one. George Edmund Street. Now, when he built these churches, do you think he would have thought that um, 150 years later, exactly in Great Britain, as I read, twice a year, two churches are desacralized, you know, uh, they are, uh, a new function is attributed to them, you know, either condominium, and I even read that a circus bought a, a church or rented it because they, it was easy for them to exercise for circus uh, inside the church because of the, tall, uh, of the tall ceiling. We also have a Romanian architect, perhaps the most accomplished uh, Romanian architect, architect outside of the country, Dan Hanganu, who himself transformed a church in Canada into a library and another one into a theater.
I should make another presentation about this gentleman because uh, it's tiring, you know, so many little, uh, little churches and with just one picture. Uh, what is this? Um, Not all of them are very impressive, uh, you know, architecturally or aesthetically, but uh, it depends if you like uh, organic matter like bricks and stone, even if the building is not very accomplished aesthetically, it, you are moved by the tectonics of the material, like here, the wall, the, the enclosure around the, the uh, you know, the site. You know, even the patina itself uh, has nobility because it's about earth, the bricks and the passage of time and so on. Another one, God, too many churches built by this gentleman. Another church, indeed. Now, by the way of churches and graves, you probably know that Lucian Blaga, the great Romanian poet, uh, was buried uh, a few meters away from a church uh, in Lankram. And unfortunately, uh, in front of the grave, uh, at a certain distance, I don't know, 10, 15 meters, uh, um, a sports uh, facility was built. And the poet left uh, in his will, his desire to be able to so-called see from the grave, the distant uh, hills that he loved so much. Well, he cannot do it any longer because the sports uh, facility, a big, uh, you know, kind of, a, you know, a big structure built for sports uh, was, uh, is blocking now the view uh, from the grave to the to the um, uh, the distant hills, and I know that uh, Li Chanu protested and wanted to destroy that 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 uh, uh, sports facility. But uh, upon visiting it, I saw that it should be kept. First, it was built. It is built. Uh, money was spent. Efforts were made. Plus, the children love it. They play there. So I thought, uh, and I didn't even wrote a competition a text for uh, how to negotiate, to, to facilitate somehow a relationship between the grave of Lucian Blaga uh, as, in case he, uh, you know, uh, would like from his Domus Eterna to look at the, at the, at the distant uh, hills. Uh, so to keep the, the sport facility, the building, but also to, uh, to make possible a certain visual connection between the grave of the poet, who is interested to, to think about, about a possible solution, you should write to me and I will send you the text and the many photographs I took there. I am sorry about this digression, but I thought of it when I, when I look at these small churches with um, gravestones around. Um, Once I wrote a little poem called The True Workers, and it started like this. Um, uh, the stone awaits again the true workers. That was the first line of the, of the poem. The stone awaits again the true workers. Well, you know, it was more wishful thinking, but I do think that the stone uh, is um, or should be again uh, material... Uh, you know, architects should love to work with. A chapel uh, by the same architect, uh, George Edmund uh, Street, uh, parish church, another one, too many. I think every single village in Great Britain has must have a church by this architect. 
what is this? I usually like my presentations to be different, but in this case, I chose to be correct and thorough. So I, 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 I included probably all the little works that he did uh, and uh, with just one or two images. And I think the presentation could be a little bit boring and uh, I, I apologize for it. Uh, but, uh, you know, like an introduction to, to, his, um, to his work, uh, maybe it's a good ad memoir, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but it, it intimidates me a little bit, this, um, you know, uh, avalanche of, uh, you know, works one after the other, and I cannot uh, develop too many thoughts around one because, uh, you know, the next one is asking for uh, a quick, a quick appraisal. Parish churches, parish churches, many, St. Nicholas Parish Church, the countryside of Great Britain. Well, this is a more, you know, urban church, bigger in scale, as you can see, but, but still imposant and uh, maybe too much so. Imagine doing the working drawings for this building, you know, just for this building. Somebody wrote to me yesterday contemplating the drawings of uh, Andrea Palladio, and he said, a student from uh, the university here, he told me, you know, they, the drawings, you know, are, were very minimal with some uh, uh, notations having to do with proportions, but that's about it, very simple drawings, and the and beautiful buildings came into being. That means the constructors, the builders, uh, um, you know, had room to, uh, you know, e express their own creativity. Uh, and uh, this is not what is happening now because of the contract documents, which prescribe everything, I mean, everything. So the poor builder has no pleasure at all, no, no room to in innovate anything or create anything. Uh, he has to, uh, you know, at literam reproduce what's in the project, in the in the built work and could be a tiring uh, affair really what if we give incomplete uh, projects to to builders you know but then you need builders of some quality you know some uh, good craftsmen uh, you know if you have a team of good craftsmen good builders perhaps you can uh, you know create a, you know uh, almost ad hoc plants and sections and so on, and have the building grow up uh, through the collaboration, spontaneous collaboration between the architect and the builders. It's possible. And this was possible when craftsmen had, um, you know, uh, uh, knew very well their job. And uh, so the architect uh, uh, trusted them. And sometimes the architect was himself a master builder or uh, he worked together with the builders. Too many churches, sorry, I, I have to accelerate a little bit. I, plus they are very similar. Uh, and, uh, sorry, uh, Mr. Street, this one is a little bit different and not because of the car in front of it, but uh, maybe because of its scale mainly. Now, this is not a good presentation. I, I, should, have, I should have watched it before I, uh, I uh, made the announcement that I will uh, pay homage to him. Uh, I have to do another one. That's why, forgive me for being a little bit quick because uh, it, it, it is tiring to see so many little churches one after the other, one after the other. Now, this building, you see it's a church, but it was transformed into a condominium. <laughs> right now, there are apartments here inside the church, the church built by uh, uh, George Edmund uh, uh, Street. 
so as I told you, this is a phenomenon that uh, started uh, some time ago and it goes on maybe in an intensified way every year. Would you like to live inside the church, let's say here to have, and this almost looks like a, a dorm for students, you know, we have these, uh, you know, individual rooms here, you know, inside the church. Could be interesting, but I don't know. I don't know what your relationship with God is, you know, how you would feel to, to live in, um, you know, uh, the house of God. I guess they have a very impressive, um, you know, uh, common space or, uh, you know, public space, because uh, what would you do with that central space of the, of the church? This, was, this would have been inconceivable in, in the Middle Ages, inconceivable, but it is conceivable now. The new St. Stephen's Church um the you know the passage uh, the passage of time is always impressive the you know the patina that it leaves behind but organic materials age well even if even if uh, material is uh, old so to speak it ages well but but uh, artificial materials do not age in the same way now Plastic will not age uh, romantically, as far as I know. Nor the layers on the on the flat, uh, uh, you know, terraces of our buildings. There is nothing romantic about them when they age. And sometimes there is nothing romantic even before they age. And there are always troubles. I lived in several countries, and I can tell you, it's always raining or the right infiltrations of water, you know, through the, you know, the flat, uh, uh, you know, terrace, uh, the flat roof of uh, an apartment building, doesn't matter where you are, in Romania or France or the United States, it's still, there are still uh, uh, troubles there. Ah, too many. It's an utterly dull picture. Ah, yeah, this one is, let's read a little bit because it's interesting, the new intervention. So All Saints Church in Clifton, Bristol, it's an utterly dull picture, but I love, someone wrote this, but I love the building and its mix of all the new. As I remarked to Martin, I don't know who Martin is, I thought of All Saints and the Catholic Cathedral as rocket churches when I was a child. Well, it was the Saturn V era. Well, this was, uh, you imagine, this was not built by uh, Edmund Street, it was a bit later, but, you know, uh, I guess some people like it uh, more than as it is. Another one, a rural church, another one, Greater Manchester, I guess, uh, you know, at the outskirts of Manchester. Churches, churches, churches. Today I, I, I read on Arch Daily that mad architects in China, the celebrated uh, architecture office, um, they built a social housing in Beijing. And uh, I think they did a, a, something uh, interesting uh, and we should look at it because um, it's not very often that star architects build a social housing, but med architects did it this time. Although I think uh, something could be improved, uh, but uh, we can talk about it later. But I like very much that, uh, you know, mundane, highly successful architects like med architects also build for the, the underprivileged, uh, you know, social housing. This is a very good thing. too many churches, really, I can't take you any longer. Sorry, um, uh, Mr. Uh, Street, just too many, please.
terrible, uh, terrible, terrible presentation. I, 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 I apologize to you. Saint John the Divine. This is the name of the biggest cathedral in the world. That is in New York City, but this is not in New York City. Designed by George Edmund Street. Pepsner describes this as one of the best Victorian churches in South London. You know Pepsner, uh, the important uh, architecture historian. The splendid tower wasn't completed until 18, 18, 18, 88, 89 by his son. Uh, here it is. Well, so again, uh, Pepsner describes it as one of the best Victorian churches in South London. But that's only South London. What about the other four cardinal points? I guess it's OK. Anyway. Uh, terrible presentation, really. Uh, now, this is not my style, but in this case, I did it in this way, and uh, now I feel embarrassed. It's just an accumulation, uh, an aggregate of many little pictures of uh, different churches, and one can get easily bored. I would not be surprised if, if when I look at now the list of participants to see no one here any longer. I, I would not blame you if, you if you let me talk to myself now. Come on, come on, come on, please show us something else. Show us a block of flats, show us a different thing. I'm tired of the so many churches, although I love churches and I love the Gothic and even the neo-Gothic, but this is getting tiring. There are just too many. Hopefully some trees show up, that's good. And but interesting things here at the top in this case. Now I have to do another, and I, I had 200 pictures. That's um, that's too much, uh, you know. To but this church is not too bad compared to some of the others, I think. can't take it any longer. I'm impatient, sorry. And I imagine you are even more impatient than I am. St. Mary's Church, hopefully we'll go to uh, Dada artist uh, after this and we'll uh, breathe uh, easier with all due respect for the neo-Gothic and for Mr. Street. Come on, Mr. Street, please, please tell us that you finished your work, please. Barracks, at least now we see some pictures from the inside. The guards' chapel, even the guards had had their own chapel and an impressive chapel, St. Andrew's Church. No, no, no. I'm very disappointed of myself. I truly am. <laughs> this, it's impossible to, to make of this presentation a pleasant uh, presentation. No, it's impossible. It's, a re it's, it's a thorough, but it's, it's terrible. It has no, has no rhythm. It's not organic. It's, it's, it's contrived. It's, it's, it's like an accountant did it, not an architect. Forgive me, I apologize again. This is a terrible, terrible, terrible presentation. I'm impatient, my skin is beginning to uh, itch. Sorry, Mr. Street, I have nothing against you, but it's just too much, too many little churches have not the greatest merit, most of them.
finally, at least one in the city, you know, at least uh, we have a different, different surroundings. Uh, another one, another village church, all same church in Rome. Now he built in Rome too. This is interesting. And even the building is, uh, it has nothing to do with Rome, but it is in Rome, apparently. Um, yeah, so he arrived at, uh, in Rome as well to build a church for who knows what uh, you know, uh, denomination. There are so many. That's it? That's it. So I apologize again. And now we go for a, you know, a little bit of fresh air from a Dadaist of all people. And I'm glad that I have this chance because otherwise I would have left uh, tonight uh, with an extremely unhappy, uh, you know, uh, uh, bitter taste in my mouth. Kurt Schwitz, Schwitzers, Schwitters, uh, a, a German artist, he was not an architect, but I felt that we should remember him because he was born on the 20th of June and um, he built a room for himself that is uh, stunning still, very stunning. This was the man. I like the Dadaists. I like their protest. I like their rebelliousness. And I like the fact that out of the four founders of the Dada movement, two were Romanians. Tristan Tsara, meaning Tristan Tsara, that's where his name came from, Tristan Tsara, the poet, and Marcel Iancu, Marcel Iancu, the architect and the artist. So out of the four, two were uh, Romanians. Kurt Hermann Eduard Karl Julius Schwitters, God, a long name, born on the 20th of June and died in 48, was a German artist who was born in Hanover in Germany. Schwitters worked in several genres and media, including Dadaism, constructivism, surrealism, poetry, sound, painting, sculpture, graphic design, typography, and what came to be known as installation art. He's most famous, he's most famous, he is most famous for his collages called Mertz pictures. Uh, I think we need non-conformism a lot, the more the better. The more non-conformist people in art and in culture in general, the better. So please, 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 you students and young architects, be as non-conformist as possible. Dress extravagantly, eccentrically, uh, smoke uh, special cigars, uh, uh, intoxicate yourselves with art, with culture, with ideas, promote the new, be eccentric, uh, make eccentric proposals, um, outrage your clients, risk uh, having nothing to eat, but express yourselves. Uh, here it is uh, one of the Merz uh, collages of this um, interesting German artist uh, who also built and uh, I included a picture of that uh, special room that he did in the, in, the, in the invitation I sent yesterday, but I, I am afraid I I wrote wrongly the 21st of June, now it was meant for today, the 20th of June. Um, express yourself artistically. Any architect I'm sure has artistic tendencies. I, I'm sure, if not any, but most. Paint, draw, play the violin, write a poem, dance widely, do things from the heart and you'll feel better. And ideally dance also in your projects. If you, if you can take the risks, but you should, you should take the risks because that's when life is pleasurable, when it's exciting, when your parents turn their backs on you and you play with the fires, with the, with the, with the, you know, exactly what they told you not to do, you know, because that's what parents do, you know, don't play with the matches. And when they turn their backs on the children, the children have nothing more exciting to do than start playing with the matches. Why is it so? Why is it that the, the, the restricted, the interdicted things are so deliciously appetizing? Why is it so? Why is it that we are attracted by what is uh, uh, interdicted? Why? 
uh, like uh, again, like Zwie Hacker uh, said, uh, real art and real architecture cannot be totally legal. I would agree with him. So please do illegal projects. The more, the better. The more illegal, the better. Well, make sure that they will not collapse or anything like this, but do things that are, you know, uh, disobedient. I'm a great promoter of a disobedient architecture. I'm sure Mr. Street was not very disobedient. Maybe that's why I got impatient uh, towards the end of the, of, the, of the presentation. These are the things we are fighting for. What are the things we are fighting for? Now, Merzbau and Metalepsis, Merzbau and Metalepsis, look at this, he built this. And, uh, you know, is it architecture? I think it is. Is it sculpture? In a way, it is sculpture as well. It's a, is it installation art? It is. It's all of the above, but it's interesting. It's uh, engaging. It's, uh, uh, you know, provocative. And uh, it doesn't matter the pictures are in black and white or in colors. Uh, it's still uh, an intriguing interior. And he built it himself. So a suggestion to architects, if you don't have commissions, you can, uh, you can begin to slowly outrage your parents, you know, if you live with them, if you are a student, uh, you know, by uh, transforming your own room according to, to your whims. Of course, this would require some work, but uh, you might make it into the history of architecture, as Mr. Schwitzer uh, did. Why is it, I mean, why am I attracted by it? I think because he breaks the, you know, the predictability of walls and uh, it becomes in a way Gothic, no? In a, in, a modern, in a modern way, there is some kind of a Gothic spirit. You know, it is uh, upward movement, the fragmentations, uh, so, uh, you know, there are triangular elements also. So there is some kind of artistic aspiration here uh, of an architectural order that I think it is enticing. And uh, yeah, we, I, I, I continue to think that without art, life could be uh, unbearable. Sometimes also because of art, art is, uh, our, uh, life is unbearable when art is not good. Uh, so I know I'm contradicted myself, contradicting myself, uh, but um, as somebody said, I think Bertolt Brecht, um, you know, contradiction means life, uh, mean life, uh, sometimes at least. So look what, what Kurt built, you know, why did he do it? Why did he do it in this way? Why did he do it? And why is it more interesting than most rooms that architects conceive? Why? Well, because he was an artist, he was crazy. He was doing things like nobody else was doing. He was an acrobat, like in the poem that Le Corbusier wrote that Doshi uh, quoted from. Um, I, I personally think we need more architects who are uh, you know, indulging in, in uh, externalizing their idiosyncrasies and their visions and the, you know, uh, joie de vivre and even their anxieties. Because here there is also an expression of some, some level of anxiety. Maybe this is an image of his own brain. Uh, it's very possible, this room that he conceived in this way. But please remember, this was done uh, a long time before deconstructivism. So I guess there is nothing new in the world. I wonder what, uh, you know, uh, George Edmund Street would have thought of these works if he saw them. What if, he, what if one of his churches would have looked like this? Inside, maybe outside as well. I would have been less impatient. Now this, I'm not sure he did this. You know, 
I'm confused. I, 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 I did try to find out. I found the information, Kurt Schwitzer's, Schwitzer's in Catalonia, 1952-1957, Hotel Merzbau. But it's possible this was done by someone else through the techniques of manipulating images in the present. But it doesn't matter. It, uh, it's, 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 it's an interesting, I think, uh, idea to bring to architecture the, the fragmentations that um, uh, this uh, German artist, uh, uh, you know, externalized in, 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 in that room that we just saw. But here we see uh, echoes uh, of his work outside of a large building as well. And uh, it's a project, of course, uh, it's, but, but I think uh, there are suggestions here for uh, uh, sabotaging, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the predictability of a, of a building that is too sure of itself, of its monolithic, uh, uh, you know, qualities. So it's, it's, um, it's a subversion, subversion here. It's, it's, a, it's a subversive architecture. But the idea of a subversive architecture is very data, isn't it? So please think about it, dear students and young architects. If you cannot make some kind of a subversive building or subversive architecture. Now here the subversion is not only at the level of architecture, but also at the level of this acrobat who is doing what he's doing here. Anyway, and this is evolving towards some kind of a psychedelic uh, uh, environment or psychedelic architecture, which is another interesting realm to explore. Psychedelic architecture, why not? Isn't our mind often during a nightmare or during a dream psychedelic? I think it is. So let's uh, attempt to bring the world of the dreams, sometimes at least, in some of our projects. Merzbau, the Cathedral of Erotic Misery. Um, this is uh, the title of a book written by that person, Elizabeth. Uh, I can see uh, Gali, I can see very well her, her name, uh, but you see, I'm sure, better than me because you don't have uh, my uh, inappropriate um, eyeglasses. But I like very much this, and maybe it's a good transition to the last little chapter, very, very little of this presentation today, uh, the hopeless cathedral. Let's read again, the cathedral of erotic misery. I like this very much. I do. <laughs> I do, and I'm not going to go into, you know, uh, certain details here, but it's something about this title, which I think is very well chosen. You know, Merzbau, the Cathedral of Erotic Misery. You probably have an intuition of what she wanted to say because she was referring to the room uh, by uh, Schwitters that you saw. And, uh, you know, indeed someone uh, psychoanalytically, or, you know, inclined could indeed seem so, uh, could see some erotic misery in that, uh, you know, uh, unhappy exuberance that the, that the room displayed. So from the Cathedral of Erotic Misery, let's go now to the, um, the uh, inadequate homage to uh, Emil Choran, where I, I will show uh, what I already showed, in fact, uh, in, in that um, I, I intended to amplify this, uh, this uh, presentation, but uh, I didn't do it. Instead, as I said, I, I suggest to you, if you want to visit that website and you see a few more works there, just uh, search for the name Choran. But here I will show you something that I did. <laughs> I don't know if, he, uh, you know, uh, for the same reasons uh, Schwitters did what he did. Um, I. I, I, I imagine some kind of a hopeless cathedral. And uh, here is the text. A cathedral without hope is the ultimate oxymoron. A cathedral is an upwards movement towards nothing else but hope. 
This is why perhaps Nietzsche was against hope, because obviously he was against a cathedral. A hopeless cathedral is Sisyphus Cathedral, or the Cathedral of Sisyphus, except that Sisyphus neither needed nor envisioned a cathedral, even if he was perhaps the one who needed it the most. You know about Sisyphus, that he was pushing his stone all the way up the hill, and when he arrived at the top of the hill, he allowed to you know, fall downwards with a stone uh, following him and maybe even crushing him. Uh, so even if he was Sisyphus, perhaps the one who needed it the most, but to build it, to build a cathedral without actually believing in its powers is to act against its true nature. Thus, a hopeless cathedral is a contradiction in terms, since oxymoronic, but it is better to acknowledge its inner contradictions than to entertain unsustainable illusions. What did I try to say here? That Emil Choran, uh, you probably know, was a pessimist uh, who saw a lot of darkness in life and a lot of lack of horizon of hope. But I think at least indirectly and obliquely and maybe even unconsciously, he had some kind of a desire for what we might call the above. After all, his father was a churchman. He also, his, he was in love with Johann Sebastian Bach, the great, great, great German composer whose whole music in a way, a sound cathedral and a beautiful cathedral. But a cathedral, a hopeless cathedral would be, I think, appropriate for, for uh, Emil Choran. Because Choran, if, even if he didn't uh, express in any way, uh, you know, uh, a belief in belief or a belief in faith, I think somewhere his whole oeuvre is in a way some kind of a, aphoristic uh, cathedral of words uh, with paradoxes, with contradictions, with oxymorons, with uh, conflicts. In a certain way, maybe, maybe his, his own work is some kind of a cathedral of erotic misery. Maybe, I am just speculating now, but we can talk about it. And what I did uh, playing with Archicad is this. This is the view of the cathedral without hope which I dedicated to, to uh, Emil Choran. And uh, this is a side view. It's a sketch, of course, it's just a sketch. But I wouldn't mind if it was built, if I had a knowledge, further knowledge of Archicad with which I played, worked, play worked or work played, uh, I, I could develop it. And uh, maybe a physical model would make it even more, um, you know, uh, convincing. We know very well that in Bucharest is being built now a cathedral. Now something like this would look very strange, no, uh, in in the vicinity or in the mental vicinity of uh, of the cathedral that is being built. It would also look very strange if we keep in mind the churches, the many many churches, most of them rural, that uh, uh, George Edmund uh, Street built, that you just saw. But, you know, I, I think a philosopher like Emil Choran and an artist like Kurt Schwitters uh, and uh, an architect of the 19th century like uh, George Edmund uh, Street, somehow if you bring them together and you contemplate uh, um, you know, both Eros and Thanatos, the cathedral is closer to Thanatos, not to, to death. On the other hand, life needs Eros. It's based on Eros. Life cannot be without Eros. But then what do we do with the erotic misery? Why did that author talk about, uh, you know, that uh, room that uh, Schwitters built as being the cathedral of erotic misery? And questions, questions, questions. I think we can all lay on the on the sofa of uh, Dr. Freud and uh, open up uh, our um, you know anxieties and our uh, uh, 
uh, inquietudes and our obsessions and our uh, whatever populates our mind and our, our spirit. But all in all, I think we need a philosopher who asks questions. We need the artist who visualizes, if not the answers to the questions, the questions themselves. And we see we, we need an architect who is not afraid to tell the truth about his or her own time. We cannot build any longer churches like uh, George Edmund Street. It's impossible. Although Romania built a lot of churches kind of in this spirit, but not uh, inspired by the Gothic times. So I end this uh, imperfect uh, presentation today with, uh, with uh, this image and uh, we wish happy birthday to the first two. And we regret that um, Emil Choran died in uh, 1995 on the 20th of, uh, of June. And I thank you for being here.